you think about the different things we think about in life. You know, um, good and bad and evil, um, right from wrong, moral, uh, certainty or not. All the different things that we deal with in life uh, as far as our hearts and minds go. And there seems to be a lot of confusion uh, as far as what is the soul of man. If you, if you look in the dictionary or you go online, you guys are used to going online and seeing things, go online and look up the soul. There's so much confusion and so much dialogue over what the soul is. Is it the spirit? Does it live within us? Is it something given to us at birth, at conception, if we get saved or not? Or what is the soul of man? Um, and I came across this passage, uh, 3 John 1, 2 through 4. It's only one chapter, but 2 through 4. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that's in you. Just as you walk in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So with that being said, I have to ask you, how's your soul today? How's your soul doing? Not your body, not your mind. And by the way, I came across some fairly fascinating facts about the human brain. It really is remarkable. 2% of our body mass is the human brain. Usually it's about 3 pounds, right? Gorillas, by the way, have 4-pound brains. Not that they're any smarter. Um, but it uses up 20% of the oxygen that we take in. Isn't that something? One-fifth of all the oxygen that we get goes in our brain. It's made of 60% fat. High cholesterol diets are actually good for the brain. Who knew? Go online and, and play video games or play video games on your computer or your, your uh, iPad or your phone. It actually is helpful for your mind. It actually is not to excess, of course, and be careful of the ones you choose. But that being said, we are actually complete when there are three parts of us working all at once. When the Spirit, and with our Spirit, we communicate, of course, with the Holy Spirit, and that's how He speaks to us and through us to others. Also, we need to have our soul intact, of course. The soul is the rational, uh, the emotional, the parts of us that are intrinsic to us and make us us, right? Now, most people, and I agree with this, believe that your soul and your spirit will continue. Uh, if you're saved, your soul continues uh, regardless of whether you're saved or not. Uh, your spirit is dead, of course, if you're not saved. But if you are, that enlivened spirit, that quickened spirit, the King James would call it, goes with you forever. And, of course, the body. And the body is simply a way that the soul can get done what it wants to get done. Now, the soul of man is interesting, whether, and here's the incomplete person, no spirit involved. The soul of man is actually, or people, is actually very interesting to me. If you think about it, it's almost like we are a soul and we have a body also to do what the soul wants us to do. So then, the eye gate, the ear gate, the mouth, the nose, the fingers, you know, touch and all that. These senses that we move through life with, these are the sensory inputs that our soul uses to try and react to the world around it. So if we fill our hearts and our minds and our eyes and our mouths and our noses and ears and hands with things that are not godly, the only input that our souls have and the only things that our bodies will do are ungodly things, right? So the spirit comes and he enervates our spirit. He activates our spirit. And now we have another source of information for our souls. We're no longer relying just on the soul. <coughs> now we can look and we can see things from a godly perspective, from a spiritual perspective that we never could before. That's why the Bible says that the to the a person who is unsaved, the, the matters of spiritual and spirituality are foolishness. They cannot understand them because they're this guy without the spirit. 
They're simply a soul and a body. They have no spirit. They have no way to, to take the information and to activate that through their souls and into their bodies. Right? Make sense? Awesome. With that in mind, we can move forward. So there are three views of man. There's the first one, mon and, uh, monism, and this just says, I have a body. Nothing else really matters. I don't have a soul. I don't have a spirit. I'm just going to do whatever feels right to my body. You know, if it makes me feel better in my body, I'm going to do it. Then you have dualism. This says that I have a body and I have a soul, but I'm still just going to do what feels right. I'm going to take all the inputs that I get, and I'm going to please myself in whatever that means. And then trialism. This says that I have a body, I have a soul, but I have a spirit on top of it all, governing it all, guiding it all, and being um, communicating with the Holy Spirit and being led of the Holy Spirit. So then, if you think about how God has created us, uh, he's given us a body, he's given us a soul, and he's given us a spirit, like the triism here. And then you have God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, and it is in those spiritual realms, the Holy Spirit to our spirit is how he communicates with us, Right? It's how he guides us. That's why we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's like an extension cord. You got any network people in here? Anybody does networking? No? Ah, back there. Networking, you have a cord. The cord plugs into the wall, but that's not all it does. It plugs into a big network, right? That's what it's like for you in your spiritual life. If the Lord has, has woken your spirit through salvation, he takes you and he plugs you in, and now you're part of a large network of believers, a network of spiritual uh, things, if you will. All right. Now, this is the mission statement of God. This is the mission statement. Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. How many in here were lost at one time? Just one person wasn't. That's good. <laughs> we were all lost, right? Every one of us was lost. Have you ever thought about why God came to save the lost? Now, God could have made us saved, right? It, it, the garden didn't have to happen. It was something that he wanted to happen. Have you ever thought about why God wanted the Garden of Eden to happen, the fall and all that? I mean, wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't it have been interesting to have been created into an existence where you could not sin and you didn't even know there was such a thing as sin. You just were born and then you're in the presence of God forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Why did God do that? You know? Why all the trees in the garden but one that we couldn't eat from? You know, you think about the Garden of Eden and you have this tree here. You have probably a thousand trees in this garden. If not 20,000. I have no idea how many trees are in this place. But you have all these trees, and God takes Adam, and he puts him in the garden. He says, Adam, you can eat from that and that and that and that. And he goes all the way around the entire garden. He says, but that one. Don't eat from that one. Now, we as Christians hear that. We hear all the permission and one restriction, and we go, thanks, God. Why? Why can't I have that tree? Because that's the kind of people we are. That's the kind of people all people are. We usually go for the restriction rather than the permission. But God, through his grace, gives Adam all this permission with a single restriction, and Adam blows it, right? But why did God do that? Why did God do that? You know, I think he did it for the same reason. Uh, now, I'm old enough to remember Corton and Sparkin. I'm from West Virginia. We use Corton and Sparkin. That means that I'm going to hunt down a pretty girl, and I'm going to start wooing her. <laughs> I'm going to take her out. I'm going to sweet talk the girl. I'm going to do what I need to do. It's called courting and sparking, for those of you from the city. Uh, but if you're from West Virginia, from the, the mountains of West Virginia, it's courting and sparking. And I remember that feeling, the excitement of that, and how much fun it was getting to know that young lady about ready to sit down in that red sweater. <laughs> I, I, did, I told her I wouldn't say her name this time. Usually I say her name, but I'm not going to do that. I don't want to embarrass her by saying her name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Kathy. <laughs> but 
Yikes, this mm -hmm. thing tips. Um, but I think God wanted, I think he wanted people to love him because of who he is, not because they had to. Not because they were born loving him. Because we weren't. I hated God. I don't know if you remember your salvation experience, but I remember mine. The last thing I wanted was God. I was running as fast as I could in the opposite direction from God. And God stopped me in my tracks and forced me to my knees and I accepted him. I didn't want to, quite honestly. I thought I was having fun. Sin is pleasurable for the season, is it not? But God loves the lost, and he wants the lost to love him. He wants to use us, you and me, and all those that call upon the name of Christ as his voices, as his hands, as his feet. That's why this thing that Miss Diane and the others are doing, Paul and the others, and Peter and the other people are doing, giving leadership into this outreach is so critical. There are people out there that don't know Jesus Christ. You know, all they ask from us is that we come out and help. <laughs> you know, spend a little bit of our time investing in people who are lost. God loves the lost. You know, we're going to see that today. So turn with me, if you would, to Luke 15, if you're not already, already there. And let's look at this a little bit. We're not going to go really deeply into this chapter. We're going to kind of look at the entire chapter. I'm just going to really focus on verses 1 and 2 more than any other. Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now let's break this down a little bit. Uh, Luke spent a lot of time with the Apostle Paul. Um, and he has come to a place in his life where he doesn't really care if people like what he's going to say or not, he's going to boldly bring out the words of Christ. And he does in these passages. Um, let, let me break down just a little bit of verse 1. Then all. I had an old uh, friend many years ago. I knew a pastor, and um, he used to say, all means all, and that's all all means. All. It's entirely possible that uh, all of the tax collectors and the sinners were gathered. Um, tax collectors during this time, publicans in the, in the King James Version, were the most despised people group you can imagine. I want you to think just for a minute, the people you dislike the most. Who are they? Maybe people who are a, a uh, different political party. Maybe politicians themselves. You know, the old joke, Christian lawyer. There are Christian lawyers, but some people hate lawyers. Um, doctors, whatever it is. Maybe different skin colors. Maybe different genders. Maybe different age groups. Whatever it is. The people you despise the most, that's who he's talking about here. Those guys. And tax collectors were despised because it was their job to tax everything in the life of the Jew. These tax collectors were Jews themselves. Um, they were given this job because they knew that uh, they would be very uh, serious about collecting this money. Now, look, I, have a, I had a Jewish mama, all right? I know the old, all the Jewish jokes, but I'm going to say one. <laughs> Jews know how to get money out of people. It's just what they do. All right? My mom was that way, and if you know good Jewish women, they're very thrifty people. All right? Um, so the Jewish people just en masse know how to make and retain money. They know how to pull it out. And the Romans were using that skill set to their advantage. They would go into a town or a city. They'd, they'd offer the job to different people. Matthew, of course, was a tax collector right, in Capernaum. Zacchaeus was the main tax collector. Um, and you, you look at these guys, and they have things in common, like they know what they're doing when it comes to raising money and pulling money. They would, they would tax two wheeled carts, 
They would tax four-wheeled carts twice as much as a two-wheeled cart. They tax how many fish you pulled out of the sea. They tax how much grain you had, how many sheep you had. If you had more than one cloak, you'd get taxed on the second one. I mean, they were very serious about taxation. Because of that, the Jews hated the tax collectors. They considered them traitors and horrible people. Now, the word sinner here is not just like a little girl sinning. This is a serious, capital S, sinner. These are people who uh, live the lifestyle. It's, uh, as a matter of fact, in the Greek, it actually says they enjoined sin. They loved it, right? Uh, it's something they, they just love to do. But these people were drawing near to Christ to hear him. Now, Jesus, as you know, the Lord never held back um, words that were going to be honest and truthful. Uh, he never stopped challenging people in their sin. He never once, uh, you know, pulled away from calling something wrong, if it was wrong. But these people are gathering near him. And I had to ask myself, why? If I'm in this lifestyle, why would I want to hang out with this guy? I mean, he is God, right? Right? Now, I didn't know he was God, but this guy is God. He's a very holy person. He's a very righteous person. So why does he want sinners hanging out with him? And I, I came to realize it must be because of the grace and the mercy and the acceptance and the love I would have felt from him, right? What a, what a wonderful thing that would have been to feel that. This was his community. These are the people that Christ came to save, but it's also the people he loved hanging out with. These people that needed a savior. They needed a shepherd. In verse 2, and the Pharisees and the scribes complained. I love people who complain. I was reading last night, I was reading something uh, written by Spurgeon about complaints. He was addressing complainers in the church. But people who complain are interesting folks to me. Um, Usually they're not very accepting of their present situation and they seek to change it by any means necessary. And if they feel like they can't change it, they go off to complaining. They start complaining about it. These scribes and Pharisees, the scribes were the attorneys, the legal minds. They were the experts in the law. They were very, very sharp people. Uh, they were highly regarded. Pharisees and Sadducees came to these guys to get their rendering, their verdict on a given passage of Scripture. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were the high priests and all the priest class. They were the pastors of the day, the ministers, the elders, the people who were in charge in the churches and the synagogues of that day. And these guys did not want their synagogues emptying out uh, because people are starting to follow this other guy. Now, these sinners and tax collectors would not have been allowed in the synagogue anyway. Uh, I don't know why they were complaining. They would have never allowed them in, except that they were losing their influence. Uh, this is part of the problem. Anybody ever see Jesus Christ Superstar? You ever see that movie, that musical? I saw that once, and their depiction of uh, the Sanhedrin, uh, the leadership, Caiaphas and the others, is actually pretty close to what actually happened. Um, the there was a great jealousy that was beginning in, in the priest class towards Christ because all of these multitudes began to follow him. You know, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't pushing away. It was against the law for a Jew to touch a known sinner or a tax collector. The only thing lower was a shepherd. It was the only thing really lower than these guys, which is really weird because David, of course, was a shepherd, right? And Christ would call himself the good shepherd or the great shepherd in some versions. But these scribes and Pharisees began to complain, saying that this man receives. The Greek here is very, very straightforward in that he was receiving them unto himself. He was pulling them in. He just didn't allow them to hang out. He was out looking for these people and inviting them to service, right? He was inviting them to come here. And he eats with them. This was a line that they could not believe that he was crossing. Now, to eat with somebody during this time was to say that you agreed with whatever was going on with them. 
uh, you were having communion with them. You were really engaged with them at a very personal level. And because of that, they assumed, the scribes and Pharisees assumed that Jesus had one of three issues going on. Either he didn't know these people were sinners, or he didn't care uh, if they were sinners because he was engaged in that lifestyle probably himself, which is what most of them thought, or that he was a charlatan. And he didn't care because he was trying to fool people, you know, to get power, money, or whatever. But that is not at all um, what was in his heart. So, in verse 3, he spoke a parable to them. Their complaint is, why are you spending all this time and all this effort and all this energy into these people? They're sinners. They're tax collectors. These are the rejects. We don't want these people in synagogue anyway, right? But the thing is, Jesus loves them. Jesus was and is, he remains this day, a radical, radical individual. He loves the lost. He loves those who are sinning. You know, I used to think that if I was in some weird sin, something going on in my life, I couldn't go to God until I stopped that or whatever, whatever was going on, until I didn't do it, didn't think it, didn't feel it. Didn't go there, didn't ingest that, whatever it is. But that's exactly opposite of what the gospel says. The gospel says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? So he's not waiting for people to clean themselves up to come to him. What the scribes and Pharisees were preaching was opposite of what was true. They said that you had to clean yourself up to come into the presence of God, which is opposite of what God says. God said, come to me, all who are uh, heavy burden and laden down, and I'll give you rest. He said, bring the lost to me. Bring the sinners to me. There's no other means a man or a woman can be saved except through coming through Christ. There's no other way to get to the Father, to get to heaven, to get the peace and joy and all the things we all strive for in our lives except to come through Jesus. So he tells three stories. He tells a story of this, this, this shepherd guy who has a hundred sheep. And he says, look, here's this guy, and he has a hundred sheep, and he realizes that one of them is lost. Maybe uh, he hears the, the, the sheep bleeding somewhere, and guys, sheep are dumb. I don't know if you've ever been around sheep. Sheep are just dumb critters. You can take a flock of sheep and you can run them down this aisle. And if I had a hundred of them, I could bring that hundred down this aisle and try to get them out that door. And one dumb sheep would take a right in one of these aisles or a left and would sit at the end of the aisle crying because he would, could, doesn't know how to get back to get to the rest of the sheep. It's that, I've been around. That's the way they are. They're just dumb critters, right? So this guy realizes that one of his sheep has taken a right turn somewhere, right? Now, it's not like the sheep knew it was, it was bad or it was wrong or it was lost. It just took a right turn like dumb sheep do. It got to the wall and it stopped. And actually, sheep will stop when they get to something like that, like the wall. It'll stop and lay down. And it doesn't care if a wolf is coming. It'll lay there because that's the way a sheep is. It's just a dumb sheep. So it's not like the critter knew it was wrong or knew it was doing something goofy. That's just what they are. They're goofy. So the shepherd goes and gets it, and he finds it, and he gets it. He puts it on his shoulders, and he brings it back home, and he calls all his friends. He puts it on Twitter and Facebook and all this Instagram stuff. I found my sheep. Praise you, Jesus, right? So... The next guy he t- or the next person he talks about is the woman. Okay, they didn't have Instagram back then. Sorry. Um, the next person he talks about is a woman, and she has ten silver coins. You ever seen those movies with the women at that time where they wear those things around their head that has the coins hanging down? Ever wondered what those were? Well, they were dowries. To this day, you visit the Middle East, you can still see women walking around with those head things where they have coins hanging down. And those are uh, dowries. When a woman is betrothed, uh, engaged, she will get that from her uh, groom-to-be, you know, her husband-to-be will give her those. 
Or once a woman is married, she wears them as a mark of pride, especially in this time. So she had a one with 10 denarii on them. Each denarii is worth a day's wage. And so this was a promise uh, from her husband-to-be that even if he was to pass away, she'd have some measure of protection. It was designed to give her time to travel from wherever she is back to her father for protection or her family for protection. And um, it was 10 days worth of a man's wage at that time. She loses one. Maybe she's, you ever seen, well, maybe you've done it. You just start, like I've been up here fiddling with this little ribbon. It's just a nervous habit. I, have you ever seen people take something and spin it around? She was probably sitting there one morning, spinning that thing around, making a cup of coffee, and one of the coins went flying. She tore her house apart looking for this thing. The Bible says that she went and got a light. The homes back then are like this home, this room. There are no windows in this place, right? Nothing looking to the outside. The homes at that time had little slits. They didn't have glass back then. They had little slits in the walls to let in a little sunlight. So that even at noontime, high noon, they would light a candle to find anything of import. So it says she went and bought a lamp or a light. She lit it, and she began to search. She couldn't find it that way, so she swept out her whole house. Now, it would have been a horrible shame for this woman not to have found that coin. It's like a, she'd be damaged goods, if you will. She would lose face with her, with her uh, betrothed or with her husband if she was already married. And she didn't want that to happen, so she tore the house apart. She finally found the coin, and she was thrilled, right? Again, with the Facebook, the Instagram, all these announcements. And she goes out there and said, look, I have found the coin. Let's go party, right? Hopefully you're beginning to see a pattern. Something is lost, something is sought, something is found, and then there's a party, right? Then we come to the last one, the last story he's going to talk about. So the first man had 100 sheep, lost one. He left the 99, bad math on that one, but he left the 99, went after the one, right? Brought the Now, 99 is almost 100. You ever scored a 99 on a test? If you scored, I used to be happy with a 79, right? Yeah, C. <laughs> Praise God, right? 99, man, if I had a 99 on a test, I'd have jumped up and down. 99. Had 99 sheep, why bother with the one? Well, that's the heart of the shepherd. The heart of the shepherd is to go after the one. Leave the 99, make sure they're safe, and go get the other one, right? So you had a, a guy with 100 sheep, loses one, and he goes and finds it. Then you have a woman, instead of 100, we're down to 10. She loses one. Well, it's ten times more important to her to find the one than it was for the man with a hundred, right? Now you get a guy with two sons. One of the sons, oh, let me back up just for a moment, about the coin. The coin had no idea it was lost because it it was, it didn't have any way to know it was lost. It was just lost through no fault of its own. It's not like it took a right turn, right? Life circumstance threw it into the dustbin, somewhere under a bed, somewhere. Isn't it funny what you find under beds? <laughs> you find the strangest things up under beds sometimes. Anyway, but it ended up under something somewhere, and they had to go get a broom to get that silly thing out. They got it out, and so now we're down to the guy. And you have a man, probably a little younger than me. I'm in my 60s. He's probably in his 40s or 50s at this point. His son is coming of age. His youngest son is coming of age, and that was 13 to 15. So this boy started pretty early with his riotous living. But he came to age, and he went to his dad one day and said, Daddy, I got something for you. I know that when you die, I'm going to get uh, a lot of what you have. Now, the oldest son would have gotten the majority. He'd have gotten two-thirds. The youngest son, though, would have gotten a third. He said, I want my money now. It was his right to do that. It's not like his dad said, no, you can't do that. Yeah, he can. He has the legal right to do it. So the father said, okay, and he gave him his money. Now, the father could have said no, right? We have a heavenly father. How many times have we come to him and said, Daddy, I want to do what I want to do, right? 
And our Father in Heaven says, okay, son, go do it. If that's really what you want, go do it. So this boy takes off one day. He goes and does his riotous living thing, ends up with the pigs, and starts eating what pigs eat, and figures out one day this is probably not the way a human should live, and says, you know what? I can go back to my father. Now, I love it that this kid didn't say to himself, well, I have to be successful first. I'm going to have to learn to stand on my own two feet, right? I'm going to have to get all cleaned up and ready and then go back. No, he said, I'm going to go back to my father. He knew that in his father was love and acceptance. Now, he did not understand yet about mercy, apparently. Because he knew in his mind that he would have to earn his way back for his father. Because that's the way it was back then. When, he father, when his father was standing outside one day, looked down the road, he sees this boy walking towards him. And he sees this young man and he realizes that this is his son who was lost. And he runs to this kid. And it was so crazy. He was wearing a robe. I mean, that couldn't have been very attractive. But... He would have had to hike the robe up, and what they did is they reached back to the back, they grabbed the back, they pulled up to the front, they tied around their waistband, and they run, right? Makes a pair of pantaloons. Bet you don't remember pantaloons, do you? No, I didn't think so. <laughs> pantaloons were baggy old pants. But it made a pair of pantaloons, and the man could run that way. Well, it was not seemly for a man of, in his age and, and uh, in his position to be running down the road, but he didn't care. He ran at this young man. So he reached him, and he was found by his father. And his father puts a ring on his finger, puts sandals on his feet, puts a new robe on him, and has a party. Right? So the child is found. The, the older son didn't like it. You know the story. The older son thought it was pretty crazy that his father would do all this for somebody who had rebelled. But the, the dad said, look, son, your brother was dead, and now he's alive. He was lost, and now he's found. In all of these stories, we see that pattern being developed over and over again. Something's lost. In the first case, it was just a silly, dumb sheep. Took a right turn where it shouldn't have, ended up lost. In the second story, it was the coin that was lost, and there was nothing... It, it didn't know it was lost. It just was lost, right? In the third story, you had somebody who willfully got themselves lost, who walked away from the family, who walked away from his father in heaven, or his father in this story. But in all these cases, you had something that was lost, that was sought. Finally being found, was returned, and great joy was then in the home, right? And the Bible tells us that in, well, look here in, uh, in verse 7. I say to you that likewise there would be more joy in heaven over the one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. And again in verse 10, likewise I say to you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And it, finally, in verse 32, it was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. You know, there was a... How many of you guys... Um, before I go to that next slide. How many of you guys remember... Oh, what was the name? Oh, yeah. The Polka Talk Band. Who, who remembers that? Polk, polka? Like your, the, the dance polka? Polka Talk. T-U-L-K. Anybody remember them? They were renamed the Black Sabbath. You know the group Black Sabbath? Yeah, a couple of hands go up. 60s and 70s and even into the 80s. Their last concert was just a couple of years ago, their final concert. One of the guys wrote this up on the screen. Born in a graveyard, adopted by sin, I cultivate evil that's living within. A preacher tried saving my black damaged soul, possessed by a demon that had full control. The time it is coming when all life will end, with doomsday approaching to hell will descend. Religion won't save me, the damage is done, the future has ended before it's begun. Death's hand and the crazy, I can't stand the light of day. 
watching all the victims on their knees as they pray. God of the Almighty never answers their call. Satan is just waiting for the righteous to fall to him. I don't mind dying because I'm already dead. Pray not for the living. I'll live in your head. Dying is easy. It's living that's hard. I'm losing the battle between Satan and God. What a heartbreaking way to live your life. Can you imagine living that way? And the, the, this guy didn't have to live this way. I think we live in a world with a lot of people in that same condition. They might not be as poetically gifted and able to construct a song for Black Sabbath. But there's a lot of people who are lost in this world. And whether we're talking a coin, a sheep, or the boy, I think we have a father who seeks, a shepherd who looks, and uh, the woman. The woman, by the way, represented the church, looking for the lost for the groom, uh, the wife or the betrothed looking for the lost for the groom, um, or the father in the boy. I think he's representative in all those, all those demonstrations, all those parables of who he is and what his heart is. And he calls us to have that same heart, right? He has a heart for the lost. God loves the lost. Maybe you have some lost people in your family. Maybe you know people who don't know the Lord. Maybe yourself, you've been struggling in some area, right? Maybe there's a sin that's beset you, and you feel that you're not where you used to be and not where you should be. Maybe you would like some prayer about that. But I'd like for us to go into a moment of prayer, okay? Right? If you need prayer for yourself, if you're struggling yourself, come forward and get some prayer. Don't leave the same way you got here. That's a waste of your time. You could have slept in and had to go out for a good meal at McDonald's, get one of those fancy meals, the little breakfast they had. It'd have been, you'd have been better served doing that than to come here and waste your time, right? 